Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm David Shank. I'm a volunteer board member with the West Side Chamber of Commerce. You might have expected our chamber president, Rick Proctor. He has a bit of an illness this evening, so he's not able to be here with us, but he sends his regrets. This is one of the high events he always looks forward to because it's an opportunity for us to see democracy in action at the local level. This is the fifth West Side Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum, and our Candidates Forum is extremely important to all of us at the West Side Chamber. We see it as a great community service tradition. But let me tell you a little bit about the West Side Chamber. The Chamber was created in the year 2010 because many business and community leaders felt the west side of Indianapolis, and indeed, part of the eastern area of Hendricks County, is a special place. But it's a special place that really wasn't being heard. And we're beginning to recognize and see that the impact of citizens of the business community and our literary and arts community on the west side are beginning to recognize for what they are, a great place to live. We see it's a great special place to go to school, to raise our kids, to build a career. And you know, it's in some ways, it's a great place to come back to after you've seen New York or Chicago or Paris or Berlin or Washington, D.C. And serving our community is a very special thing for the West Side Chamber of Commerce. Notably, through the Chamber, we formed a new community development corporation called Indy Gateway. And just a few months ago, with the help of the Wayne Township Schools and uh, the Trustee's Office, we were able to purchase through Indy Gateway, which is a community development corporation, a property east of, uh, of the 465 area near Washington Street, and that property had been abandoned for a long time. Indy Gateway purchased that property. And now through the Area 31 Career and Technology Center building trade students, we're going to be building a resident and give a West Side Chamber, excuse me, a West Side resident, they may become chamber members sometime, an opportunity to start a new life and a new home. And last year we hosted our second major job fair at Pike High School. We featured more than 100 employers, and we think we probably had a thousand job seekers who were coming to look for good paying jobs in the West Side. And it's always gratifying to see that we can really provide the public service by giving people another boost in their life. So you can see the Westside Chamber of Commerce promotes vibrant, sustainable economic development and strengthens the quality of life in our community. Now I'd like for you to put this on your calendar. On November 10, the Chamber celebrates our sixth anniversary at a really special place, the Indianapolis International Airport. So if you haven't gotten any mailings on that, you want to come to that, uh, just asked to be put on the mailing list. And how many know that the Indianapolis International Airport is the number one rated airport in the world? Several people of you do. You have to remember and recognize that, too. I want to thank especially the MSD of Wayne Township, the Superintendent Jeff Butts, and Chapel Hill 7th, 8th grade Principal Sherry Patterson for making this great facility available to them. And I want to recognize that. Can we don't give them a hand of applause when they see this recording? Can we give them a Thank you. As we approach our forum tonight, I want to let you know that we are Facebook Live webcasting tonight's forum, and you can view and respond by going to facebook.com slash Westside Chamber of Commerce. And if you're into social media during tonight's program, you can use hashtag WS Chamber Forum, and we're also on LinkedIn. Our special moderator tonight is Matt Smith, anchor and political reporter for Fox 59 News and CBS 4. Matt is a multiple Emmy Award winning journalist. His reporting has taken him across the country from the White House to interview President Obama to the heart of presidential politics in Iowa. Matt has appeared numerous times on ABC World News Tonight and had exclusive political interviews have received national attention from the Washington Post to Fox News and MSNBC. And just last week, he covered the vice presidential debate at Longwood University at Farmville, Virginia. And if we're really nice to him, he might give us a little of insight into what goes on behind the scenes. Matt, the evening is yours. That was too generous of an introduction. It sounds like my mother may have written that. She did. Said, she did. She did. She did. She sent it in to you. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, as David mentioned, I am Matt Smith, an anchor and reporter at both CBS4 and Fox 59 here in Indianapolis. As he mentioned, I was at the vice presidential debate. Last weekend, the spin room outside looks a little smaller here than it was uh, at the vice presidential debate, but we'll see what happens tonight after all is said and done. We have asked our candidates this evening to focus on the key issues that impact the west side of Indianapolis. 
during this time, feel free to use the cards available or your voices, since we no longer have cards, to ask questions when the time is appropriate. Our format tonight will give each candidate the opportunity to present their positions and answer some questions. Here are the rules that have been set by the chamber. I will introduce each candidate. Each candidate will then have two minutes to present their views. I will ask a question. They will have a minute to respond. We will then take a question from the floor, if there are any. The candidate will have two minutes to answer that question and conclude. If there are no questions from the floor, the candidate still has their full two minutes to conclude their discussion. We have a chamber member in front who will be carefully timing the segment. Good luck to that person. Our forum, as David mentioned tonight, is being webcast live on Facebook Live at the Chamber Facebook page, facebook.com slash Westside Chamber of Commerce. One of the advantages of Facebook Live is that followers can respond in real time. Our forum, as we mentioned, also being recorded tonight on the City Channel, Channel 16, and in a few days will be repeatedly broadcast on Channel 16 leading up to Election Day. This broadcast will also be available in the archives, candidates. For those of you using social media on Twitter, you can use the hashtag tonight, WS Chamber Forum, and you can comment on the LinkedIn page, the West Side Chamber of Commerce, Indianapolis. The Chamber's candidate selection guidelines revolved around what offices most affect the community, West Side businesses, and the personal lives of citizens who live in Decatur, Wayne, and Pike townships. We invited the gubernatorial and U.S. Senate candidates, but they declined. In some races, a candidate is running unopposed, and he wasn't included as a speaker, but they were invited to meet with you in the lobby area before and after. However, as you will see in some of these races, if one of the candidates agreed to present tonight and their opposition is unavailable to attend, we still will grant the candidate who agreed to be here the opportunity to present to you. With that, let's give a round of applause for the candidates who have arrived tonight. <laughs> Enough of me talking, let's get to the candidates. We will begin tonight, our first candidate, Drew Thompson. Drew, you can come on up, the Libertarian candidate for the 7th Congressional District. He was born in Terre Haute and graduated from Indiana University. As an attorney, he has spent most of his time living here in central Indiana. You have two minutes. Thank you very much. It's great to be here with you tonight. Under the glare of these lights in, in the moment, I am the Libertarian candidate in the 7th District for U.S. Congress. I'm running against four or five-term incumbent Andre Carson. Uh, I chose to run in this race this year after looking in, uh, around me and seeing what's going on in the political spectrum. And I have to say, I've gotten the opportunity over the course of this election cycle to get to know many of our state candidates here in Indiana. And, you know, we are really blessed in this state to have some very strong political leaders who do a fantastic job. And even nationally, we have a history of people who've done a fantastic job. I've also got to know Congressman Carson, and as a person, we get along very well, and I, I think a lot of him personally. But I'm running because of the problems that we have nationally that are, are really become such a detriment and brought us to a point of crisis in this country. It's happened with $19 trillion in debt, with a country that where we don't, where the same politicians are elected, re-elected again and again. We have no term limits. We have gerrymandered districts across the country. And we don't have the political opportunity for independent third party voices to make a difference. I want to do that. Now, I know it takes time for change to occur, okay? I tell people I'm a Chicago Cubs fan, okay? I know about waiting, and I know about how it takes time. This could be our year, folks, and we, we want things to change. We want things to be different. They need to be different. But we've got all these great people working for us in the state house, and the media, and the city, and the school boards. We, we also need to have a very effective change in what we're doing nationally in Washington, D.C. Thank you for having me. You hit the two minutes almost on the head. Congratulations. Uh, you say you're running on the Libertarian Compact. What exactly is that, and how will that affect Hoosiers here living on the west side? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, we have an agenda. Uh, all 10 of our congressional candidates, this is the first time in history that the Libertarian Party has filled out a full slate of congressional candidates. And all 10 of our candidates signed a 10-point 
agenda called the Compact for Liberty. And I encourage you, I authored that document with a lot of help from my colleagues. Um, I encourage all of you to read that. How is that going, going to affect you here, here on the West Side? Our focus is largely on the opportunities for creative disruption to the system we have in place now, to enable entrepreneurs to minimize regulation and to give us greater opportunity to do business here and for our schools and communities to succeed. Any questions from the audience? Please repeat the question. Okay, the question was, what is one regulation I would change to take on to try, try to make a difference right away? There are so many, I don't even know where to start. I was in an international convention, uh, but I can start and I will. Um, at our national convention, we sat in a ballroom that was about four times this size, and it was stated, and I believe it's true, that if you took the, all the pages of the Code of Fe Federal Regulation and stacked them from floor to ceiling, from wall to wall, it'd fill up the entire room. If we could knock out 80% of the regulations, business, our, our people, families would be so much more free to do so many things that, that they want to do. Uh, one of the keys, if you look across the board at, at Obamacare, and, and you look at things that we've done with our healthcare system, the things that are forcing small businesses to pay so much more on healthcare premiums would probably be number one, but a very close second. I've worked in that, I started a business to help fund uh, local entrepreneurs, local, local businesses to, to succeed. It's called Tinker Street Funding. And if we could change the regulatory scheme around the Jobs Act and around Title III crowdfunding, things like today I posted about this uh, little car called uh, the Pod Ride. Um, it's actually a bicycle. And the problem for, for that little car is, is developed in, uh, not Switzerland, but I believe Sweden, and is that the regulations in the United States are preventing it from going to market, okay? If we can change that so there's a framework where new innovation can really take place, where it can do everything that's possible, our economy will be so much more strong. And that's what I hope to be able to do. Mr. Thompson, thank you. Thank you. We can clap at this forum, that's all right. Our next candidate we want to bring up uh, Angela Demery, a Democrat running for U.S. Representative District 5. District 5 covers the northern part of Marion County and north. Miss Demery is a sixth generation Hoosier, a veterinarian, and a veteran who still serves in the Army Reserves. She received her degree in veterinary medicine from Purdue University and has worked as the equine medical director of the Indiana Horse Racing Commission and in private practice. She is an advocate for veterans committed to addressing sexual assault in the military and improving the VA healthcare system. She lives here in Marion County. You have two minutes, welcome. Well, look, thank you so much, Matt, for such a kind introduction. And I am not another career politician. I am not another Washington lawyer. I am a veteran, a veterinarian, and a sixth generation Hoosier. I believe that we need leaders in Congress who are willing to put the country first. We have the fewest numbers of veterans in Congress, and the current Congress has been deemed the least productive in history. I believe we need leaders who are willing to work with others to get things done, and I have that experience. I was deployed in 2012 with a diverse group of people from all around the United States. Many of us had never even met before our pre-deployment training, and yet we were able to come together and accomplish our mission in Kuwait. That sounds a lot like Congress to me, they're from all over the United States, and they're sent to Washington, D.C. to accomplish their mission, and I think it's time we get back to that. Thank you. In, in terms of the VA, you have front access to this. How has Congress failed veterans here in Indiana, and do you have specific legislation you would like to propose to fix that? Thank you, Matt. I do have some specific legislation I would like to propose, especially in the area of military sexual assault and trauma. We have set up regional support commands with the Army. And I think it would be really great to use those resources to include trained social workers, trained and licensed therapists, when you're deciding whether or not a case is actually sexual assault. Currently, it's within our chain of command. And the beauty of this fix is that it, takes, it keeps it within our chain of command, but at the same time uses 
a separate resource so that we can all work together and have actual fair solutions. And that's something we haven't yet done. Questions from the audience? You have two minutes to conclude. Well, thank you so much again. Um, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight with all of you. You know, I will not accept the status quo and neither should Indiana. I believe that we need members of Congress who are going to stand shoulder to shoulder, roll up their sleeves and put hard working Hoosiers above their partisan ideologies. I believe in an Indiana where all Hoosiers are treated fairly and with respect where our freedoms are protected, where we have safe roads and effective public health infrastructure, strong urban, suburban, and rural communities, and a world-class public education system. We have been underrepresented for far too long. And if you all will give me the opportunity, I will be a representative that the entire 5th District can be proud of. Thank you. Congresswoman Susan Brooks, the Republican incumbent, did not respond to the invitation for this forum. Turning next to Indiana Senate District 35, as of the 2010 census, a total of 130,739 people lived in the 35th. It is a large district, stretching from Decatur Township east, nearly reaching the circle. First up tonight, the Republican incumbent, R. Michael Young. Senator Young earned his BA from Indiana University at Indianapolis in 1985. He is a manager for Holiday Park Realty and is managing partner for Phoenix Development. Senator Young is chair of the Corrections and Criminal Law Committee, ranking member on the Judiciary Committee, and serves on the Civil Law and Elections Committee. Senator Young has served as state senator for 16 years, and before that, 14 years in the House of Representatives. Senator Young, you have two minutes. Oh, thank you, Matt, very much. And thank you to the West Side Chamber of Commerce for having us uh, Forum where we have the opportunity to address the voters. I was just thinking, uh, looking at this big room, and it's not even a half full, that we have somewhere around 225,000 people on the west side in Pike, Wayne, and Decatur Township, and we have a handful of people that show up. I would think that, uh, and hope that they think that their government is more important than staying home and maybe watching the Cubs tonight, because the decisions we make on November the 8th are going to affect their lives way more than uh, whoever won the World Series, although I am for the Cubs. <laughs> so, <laughs> but hey, I grew up on the West Side. I came from a large family, I had nine children. We're not Catholic, but we had nine children. Uh, two two uh, daughters and seven uh, sons my uh, parents had. And uh, I was the oldest of the three. Went to Northwest High School, went to IUPUI, and went to uh, the law school uh, on the campus there. Well, I'll tell you just a little bit, of, uh, well, let me just tell you about my kids first, because they're probably more important than what I've done. I got three wonderful kids, two daughters and a son. My son served his country in the United States Marine, went over to Fallujah. He didn't know anyone in this room other than me, but he was prepared to give his life for all of us. And that's why I wear this tie class, is for him. He did a great job for us, I'm very honored. My daughter married a police officer, moved out to Virginia Beach in Virginia. She's had uh, two children, but she's a nurse for the United States Navy. And what she does is she takes care of those little kids who are born to a service person or an employee that have problems, difficulties, and they're not likely to live. But that's what she does and decided that was what her life should be. And my other daughter, who's a teacher, uh, and teaches children with disabilities, and uh, she sees all those kids that have problems. And the reason she got into that was she moved out to Virginia Beach to be with her sister. And to get a job, she took care of kids with disabilities so that their parent, the one that was uh, stayed at home, not the one that was on leave, could get some time. And when she saw those little kids, the disabilities and the things that the parents went through, she wanted to give her life to teaching so she could help teach those kids. Sorry. And, you can uh, no, no, I am there because I think that's perfect. I'll end, I'll end right there. I'll end right there. You mentioned law enforcement, Senator. Yeah. Uh, you have proposed tighter penalties for anyone who points or shoots a gun at police. Curious if tighter restrictions you believe are still needed here in Indiana, and if there's any specific incidents on the west side that have led you to that conclusion. Well, yeah, we still need them. Uh, our police officers, much like my son who uh, put his life on the line in the United States uh, Marines, Every day they put on that uniform, 
And nowadays, even when they don't have the uniform on, their life is in jeopardy. We had a police officer that lived in Decatur Township uh, that died up in Pike Township. We've had several officers shot at, several officers uh, where a gun would have been pointed at them. When people put their lives on the line to protect ours, we need to do everything we can to protect theirs. And so my thought is behind this, if you're gonna use a gun against a police officer, you're gonna use a gun against us and you need to be put behind bars. It's enough that police officers are shot and killed, shot and injured, or just having somebody point a gun at them. And if they do, in addition to their sentence, they can get an additional 10 to 20 years if the prosecutor wants to bring the uh, enhancement and the judge agrees to their sentence. These individuals, if they have no problem harming a police officer, they have no problem harming you and me. And they need to be off the streets and keep us safe and sound. Questions from the audience? Yes. Why did the state legislature pass a law allowing weapons to be carried into the state parks? Repeat the question, please, Senator. Yeah, it's why did the legislature pass a law that allowed the, to bring in the state parks? Now, I don't know if we had a specific law on state parks. We did have a law a few years ago that allowed people to bring guns into government areas because the Constitution in the state of Indiana is pretty clear that you can carry your gun anywhere you have a right to go. We did try to put some parameters on it in some government buildings. For example, uh, over at uh, Lucas Oil Stadium Convention Center, uh, if you have a private event, they can keep the gun out, uh, the government can't. If you go to a courthouse that has a court, uh, you can keep, the judges can keep the guns out, but not the other offices and many of the judges also carry a gun. So it doesn't make any difference where they ca carry, whether it's in a state park or in a, a public park or down the street. If they have a permit and they are legal to carry, they should have a right to take their gun wherever they have a right to do it. It's the people who don't have a permit who are not entitled to a gun that concern me, not someone who has a permit that knows how to use it and prepare to use it to protect other people's lives. It's the criminals. And what I did for people who would give a gun sell a gun or let someone borrow a gun that didn't have a right to it, they would get the same sentence as the person would get who used the gun. We need to keep those people behind bars, keep them away from uh, guns, not honest citizens who have a legal permit. All right, Senator, thank you. You're welcome. Next, we will hear from the Democratic challenger for Senate District 35, Mr. Phil Webster. <coughs> Mr. Webster is a teacher, a baseball coach on the west side of Indianapolis. He holds a bachelor's degree from Milligan College in history and political science and a master's from Purdue University. His 50-year teaching career started with short stops at North Salem and Plainfield High Schools. For the past 46 years, Mr. Webster has taught at Decatur Central High School. Mr. Webster, welcome. You have two minutes. Well, thank you. Um, someone told me there was a job opening in the Indiana State Senate so I thought I might come today and apply for it. Um, what I'm concerned about is when we serve, we have to serve you. I'm here to try to convince you to hire me to be the person that goes to the State House and tries to improve the quality of your life. I want to make sure that we get quality jobs on the west side of Indianapolis. I've been in Decatur Township most of my adult life. I've competed a lot in Wayne Township against the Ben Davis Giants. I take a look at the houses, I see the roads. The quality of life can only be improved if we get quality jobs here. And that's gotta be the challenge of the chamber. It's gotta be the challenge of the people who live here in those three, Pike, Decatur, and Wayne Township to develop the best community they possibly can. Besides quality jobs, we need highly functioning public schools. We need to take those schools and make sure that they're funded as best we possibly can. So we get to get the class size down. We need to change the way we look at education and see more vocational training. We have to improve the environment. We have to also improve the quality of the air, the water that we drink. We don't want it to East Chicago to happen here. We don't want Flint to happen here. And last but not least, we got to improve the way we look. We got, we got to take some pride in our roads and our bridges, our parks, and all those things I want to be here to help you acquire. Now, the, my most important part is we represent, Michael Young and I represent a district. District 35. We don't necessarily represent the state of Indiana. We're here to serve you. We should take pride in the way 
this west side of Indianapolis looks. We want this to be the best quality place you can li live and raise your children. And in that regard, I apply for the job. I hope you'll vote me in in uh, November the 8th. Thank you. Just today, a panel tasked with finding new alternatives to the I-STEP test met at the State House and still have no clear solutions for a new plan or a new state standardized test. What would you recommend to that committee? I think the committee needs to look very closely at the way teachers interact with their students. The teachers are the people who tell you the type of test they need. They can almost tell you when you gave the I-STEP test or the I-STEP plus test, which by the way, the legislature threw away and it was the millions and millions of dollars that we spent without any results. When I was a kid, my second grade teacher said, you know what, Phil? Yeah, I'm not doing real good in math, but I think I'm gonna pass you on to the third grade. They, 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 they knew me. And we have, to, we have to give the test. The federal government uh, requires that we, take, we give a test. But the test has gotta be more that we measure what the child needs. As a baseball coach, if I've got a shortstop and his arm is not quite adequate, I'm gonna give him a lot of drills in which his arm can strengthen. We do the same thing with our students. This student may be lacking math skills, this one lacking reading skills. We need to trust the teacher. The teacher can evaluate the student and can recommend exactly where that student needs to improve or get better. Questions from the audience? Yes. Repeat the question, please. Uh, uh, what, the question is, what specific things could I recommend to improve jobs in this area? To create jobs. To create jobs, I'm sorry. Um, what I would recommend is we, we stop selling ourselves short. This is a great state. It has great workers. We move things well. We grow things well. We build things well. We don't have to give tax abatements that hurt schools and other institutions. We can sell ourselves. We can tell any bit business want to come here. And we can take things, which we have, in this particular, the west side, we have the airport area, we have a lot of vacant land, just what the west side chamber has done by recently purchasing uh, a building. We can, when we negotiate with, with businesses, we need to think about what the west side needs. I would strongly suggest we go look into the future and look what type of industries are gonna be here five or 10 years from now. You're gonna be taking a look at new, uh, tech, technical industries are going to be looking to locate here because of the high class airports that we have. We're going to be looking at medical facilities. We have a great university in Purdue. We have a great university at IU. We want to take those students who are graduating those, stu the, the, those universities, bring them to the west side of Indianapolis. When we have the workforce, when we have the buildings, when we have the roads, when we have the airport, the jobs will come to us. We don't have to sell ourselves short. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Our next candidate, incumbent Democratic State Representative Ed Delaney, represented District 86. Nearly 65,000 Hoosiers live in the district. It includes Eagle Creek Reservoir and the Pike Township area swinging north and across to the top of the county and back toward Broad Ripple. Mr. Delaney is an attorney, an adjunct professor at Indiana University School of Law at Bloomington, and founding attorney for Investigative Reporters and Editors Incorporated. He served in the United States Navy Last year, he served on the Courts and Criminal Courts, Judiciary, Select Committee on Government Reduction, and the Ways and Means Committee. Representative Delaney, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you very much, and thanks to the West Side Chamber. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schenck. Thank you, Matt. Um, there are really three issues that concern me the most. Uh, the first of these is education. It is the core of our responsibility, 50% of every dollar spent by the state legislature is spent on K through 12 education. Uh, we have been lost in an endless uh, search for magic solutions and silver bullets. They have not worked. We are lost as to what we need to do as to testing. We have cut the support for the 94% of our students who are in traditional public schools. At the same time, we have spent millions of dollars on various experiments like such as uh, electronic e-schools. We're wasting money and wasting time. We need to get a test that other states accept and use. Save money by doing that. Stop trying to create our own test and tying ourselves up. That's on schools. Um, the next issue I talk about is jobs. 
Let's be serious. Let's raise the minimum wage seven and a quarter in the year 2016. What, what mindless policy are we pursuing there? The other two things about jobs are our universities. We need to continue to support them. Look at the jobs that have been spun out of IUPUI, out of Purdue and IU. We need to keep pushing that. And we need to push our infrastructure to create jobs in the process of upgrading our infrastructure and to attract people in here. The third thing on jobs is let's make it cheaper to work. Let's give people decent transit. Let's help with daycare for young workers. So if their wage isn't great, their expenses are lower. We can and should do these things. So those are the things that I think are most important. As you know, it's a budget year upcoming. Right. If, if you are elected on, on transportation, would you advocate and propose items like a raise in the gas tax to pay for road funding? Well, Matt, you may not be aware of this, but we've dramatically lowered the gas tax over the last several years. And we've lowered the gas tax in two ways. First, our cars are much more efficient. So we burn fewer gallons. And when you charge 18 or 28 cents a gallon and you use fewer gallons, you get less money. So each one of us is actually spending less money on gas tax than we used to. Also, for all the criticism of our good president, the price of gas has gone way down. We get seven cents on every dollar for sales tax. Well, when it was four dollars, we got 28 cents. We now get 14. So we cut the tax. We have to find a mechanism to restore that revenue. Otherwise, the roads are going to crumble. There's a lot of different ways to do it, and I'm open to discussing that with the other members of the legislature. In principle, I want to raise more money for infrastructure because we need to spend more money. It's just that simple. Questions from the audience. What can be done to reduce the cost for students wanting to attend our colleges? What can be done to reduce the cost of students wanting to attend our colleges? Well, first of all, a lot of it is federal. We need to get the interest rates down. We need to make uh, student loans dischargeable in bankruptcy. That's complex, but it's very important. My wife's in the bankruptcy trustee business. She has people in their 60s going bankrupt because they can't pay their student loans and they can't be discharged, so they have to continue paying them and maybe they give up their home or their car. So we've got to get the interest rates down. We've got to start supporting. IU gets 17% of its revenue from the state of Indiana. 17%. There ought to be an asterisk behind the word Indiana University. It ought to be private university with a little help from the state. We need to increase that. That can help lower the tuition. So I think those are the, the principal factors that we can use. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Representative Delaney's Republican challenger, Scott DeVries, could not join us this evening. Moving now to State House District 92. Indiana House District 92 roughly covers the territory from the Raceway Road and including Speedway, East and West, and North and South from Highway 136 to Washington Street, which includes about 65,000 residents. Our first candidate is the Republican challenger, Mr. Bradford Moulton. Mr. Moulton is a veteran EMT and firefighter with the Wayne Township Fire Department and is a longtime EMT and EMS educator. Welcome, and you can begin your two minutes. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to the West Side Chamber. Mr. Shank and Matt for having us here tonight. So I'm a firefighter paramedic here in our district. I'm also an educator, a father, a husband, and a community leader. And I'm running because I truly believe that we can improve Indiana and our district. I will serve all of our community honestly and humbly. And I will strive to better inform our community of what is happening at the State House, how it affects the community, and what opportunities are available to all. So I am a leader in our community, and from, from uh, my church, from food and clothing banks, from Life Cares Community Outreach, to youth mentoring, leadership development, fraternal organizations, and serving as a chaplain for the American Legion post-64, I live, work, and serve our community. Legislative goals include continuing education reform, getting rid of ISTEP, and talking to all parties that are involved with education to replace that test and to restore appropriate funding. So that means talking with teachers, children, parents, and taxpayers. I will pass an honestly balanced budget 
that serves Hoosiers and their needs today and in the future. I will invest in economic development, small businesses who actually create most of the jobs here in Indiana, and expand and invest in universities and university programs where you have innovation centers like the Purdue Research Park. Also, I want to expand mental health treatment throughout the state of Indiana. And I really do believe that that will tackle a lot of our opioid issues, a lot of our heroin issues. When we take care of those who actually need the mental health treatments, we'll see the drug problems decrease as well. So I, can, I will continue to support all of our Hoosier veterans, our seniors, and I will strive to create an environment where from cradle to grave, our children can live, learn, and flourish in our community. And I chose to run because I know that I can do more for our community. And with your help, we can do it together. As a first responder, as you mentioned, you are on the front lines of the heroin problem here in Indiana and across the country. How severe is the problem here on the west side from your perspective? Uh, and besides mental health, are there specific legislative goals you would like to implement that you think will help reduce this problem? The problem is here on the west side, and it's staggering. Um, I personally responded to calls where we've had two people that were overdosed at the same time. Or we've had calls where we show up at a home and an hour later we're back at that same home because another person is overdosed. Um, I, I believe what Senator Merritt's doing with the education of Narcan and having prevention certainly helps. But I truly believe that the root problem is in mental health. In fact, about 90% of those people who struggle with opioid addictions or heroin addictions have an underlying either newly diagnosed or previously diagnosed mental health issue. So I truly believe that first focusing on mental health, both inpatient and outpatient, will allow us to tackle the heroin problem and the opioid problem from the front end where the true problem really lies. Questions from the audience. You have two minutes to wrap. I am the choice for our community here on the west side. I'm a public servant. In fact, I've been serving this community for over 15 years. I will represent all of our community, honestly and fairly. I will inform our community of what's happening at the State House and the issues that are important to the west side of Indianapolis, not to special interests. I do the work in our district every day, from serving as a firefighter paramedic to being a chaplain for the American Legion for teaching tomorrow's leaders in college, and to being a scout leader and a youth mentor here on the west side of Indianapolis, I am a leader. And while hard work may look different to others, I don't leave a job unfinished, I don't leave a fire burning, and I make sure that the job is done. And while I will strive to serve you in ways that will create trust, in ways that will create jobs, in ways that will create economic development here within the district, and that means you need to get involved, and you have the option to do that. Every two years, we elect a new state representative. Let us know what your needs are. Let us know how we can serve you, because that's what our job is. And it is my goal that I will always respond to your needs. Thank you very much for the time, and thank you, sir. Thank you. We will next hear from the District 92 incumbent Democratic State Representative Carly Maser. Representative Maser works for the Westside Garden Plaza Retirement Community. She is president of the Wayne Township Education Foundation and co-founder of Indy Gateway, the Community Development Corporation, which was founded by the Westside Chamber of Commerce, for which she still serves as an advisor. She has received the state's Chamber Small Business Champion Award and the Legislator of the Year from the Indiana School Social Work Association. Welcome, you have two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Again, my name is Carly Maester, and I proudly represent the west side of Indianapolis in the House of Representatives. Throughout my time in the legislature, I've been working hard to be the voice and the advocate of all members of our district. Our community was recently devastated by Carrier's catastrophic departure from the west side, and I can tell you that I've been working with employers and community ca carrier employees to help those affected transition into the fields and receive training that keeps them in good paying careers, not just jobs. Through our united efforts with business leaders and local training schools, we've been using the resources in our district and collaborating with city officials and state officials to help these hardworking Hoosiers find jobs right here in our district, 
their home without having to uproot families and start anew. I'm honored to have been one of the founding members of the Community and Economic Development Corporation, Indy Gateway. And I couldn't be more proud to have been a part of the recent growth and improvements we have seen right here on Main Street in Speedway. I look forward to duplicating the success in bringing growth, development, and prosperity to the entirety of the West Side, the area that I grew up in. Together with the Indiana Chamber, the Indy Chamber, the Speedway Chamber, and of course, the West Side Chamber, we've been able to work to improve the quality of life for members of our community. I've been working closely with city, state, and local leaders to establish our development initiatives and work towards making the West Side the best place to live, work, and raise a family. Finally, as the ranking minority member of the Veterans Affairs and Public Safety Committee, I have worked with local law enforcement, firefighters, EMS workers, and neighborhood crime watches to improve the safety and connectivity of our community for everyone. Thank you so much for having me here tonight, and I look forward to your question. You mentioned the carrier move, moving jobs from Indianapolis to Mexico. What lessons can the West Side learn from that, and could state lawmakers have done more to prevent those jobs from leaving? I can tell you one thing that we've learned here on the West Side is that we are resilient people, and you cannot keep us down. We have grown up in a manufacturing community, and too many times we've had these stories come across. But what we've learned now is that not only are we resilient, we will continue to be better prepared. We are now working within the community to make sure that we have the jobs that are available right here, but the training, the training will be available for the carrier workers and other people here in the community to make sure that they're filling the jobs within the community that are right here on the west side of Indianapolis. But most importantly, as far as the legislature, I was able to work on bipartisan work that left the House and it was about clawbacks. It was about doing what needed to be done for anyone who comes into our community and thinks that they can take advantage of our tax system and our employees and the American workers. So absolutely, there is still more to do, but I am so proud of what we've accomplished to move forward and solve the problem right here in our local community, but also on a state level and also looking to solve the national problem, our work on it as well. Questions from the audience? Yes. Repeat the comment and the question, please. Yes, she's, at, she's talking about the training. She asked the question that when she was um, at Carrier, she had received training, but it was very um, brief training um, about uh, resumes and things like that. So you're asking me, what training is it that we're working on now? Well, what's fantastic is I'm working with the state of Indiana, the city of Indianapolis, Employ Indy, and Lyft. And we're working to map out the jobs that are available right here in our community to come in to provide the training that is needed for a carrier worker who may be 60% job ready to work at that job at Allison. They'll have the training, the four, six, eight, 12 week training available to transition into that job and to be job ready. So it's much more than just doing light resumes and talking about brief training. No, this is the real deal. This is how we solve problems on a very local level to provide people the opportunity to fill the jobs that we have, that we all talk about, but to also make sure that they're job ready to provide the training that is necessary right here in our community, not just for carrier employees, not just for veterans, but for you and for me as well. These opportunities exist, but we need to make sure that we're no longer just talking about it, that we're putting it all in one place, that there's one place that you could go to to see the jobs that are available, as well as the training right here in our community. Thank you. Thank you. No, because that was the audience. Thank you so much. Good. Thank yes. you. <laughs> we shift now our attention to the Indiana House District 97, which includes portions of Wayne Township, extending to downtown South Dec Decatur Township, even into Perry Township. It represents more than 65,000 constituents as well. Welcoming to the stage incumbent Democratic Representative Justin Moed, 
He is a graduate of Butler University, has served in the House of Representatives for four years. He is a member of the Agriculture and Rural Development, Education, Local Government, Select Committee on Government Reduction Committees, and he is the ranking minority member of the Financial Institutions Committee. Welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, as he said, my name is Justin Moed, and I started out at the State House as a doorkeeper, just opening the door as people came in and out. And I worked my way up on staff, and in 2012 ran for office. And when I first ran, uh, I set out to do things a little different. We actually went to people's doorsteps, and we talked with them about what they wanted, what issues they wanted us to, to work on at the State House, and how they wanted to see their government run differently. And there were three key themes that I got when I went door to door. The first was they wanted their government to be open and accessible. And so everywhere I go, I give out my cell phone number, my email address, and I continue to knock doors, election year or not, to talk with people about what are the issues that are most important to them in their neighborhood. The second theme was that they wanted us to stay focused on issues that matter to them in their neighborhood. And that's why everything that I work on at the State House is, is, is surrounding those issues of abandoned housing, holding uh, negligent landlords accountable, improving the, the infrastructure in neighborhoods, making sure that we tackle neighborhood crime issues, improve our local schools, and everything I do at the State House stays focused on those issues that come from, from, from very, those very conversations at people's doorstep. And the third theme uh, was that they wanted us to work together toward solutions to address those, those different issues. And I think I have a very strong reputation at the State House as being very open and willing to work across the aisle with people. Uh, and, and when you go to a neighborhood meeting or a crime watch where they're trying to tackle an issue in their neighborhood and they're working with local law enforcement, uh, they're not working on those issues as Democrats and Republicans. They're working on them as neighbors and people of the city. And I think that uh, that's what people expect us to do when we get to the State House. And everything I do at the State House stays focused on those three themes, with the end being working across the aisle to make sure that we get things done for our community. Thank you. You've also proposed providing better access to healthy food by promoting urban farms, food co ops, farmers markets. What is the problem related to healthy food facing the west side? And what is the role of government, and what should that be? Sure. So one of the things I, I, I found as I've gone door to door is, is that uh, as neighborhoods have lost companies like Carrier or the GM stamping plant down in the valley, with that has gone the business corridor in that neighborhood. And the grocery store is one of those key elements to a strong neighborhood. And so people then don't have good access to a, uh, healthy, affordable food. They're reliant on the fast, foods, the fast food uh, in the neighborhood or the, the gas station, which is overpriced and unhealthy. And so neighbors and, and, and residents continue to say that they would like to see uh, an effort to try and help reestablish a grocery store in their neighborhood. And, and as you try to redevelop a neighborhood, it's really hard uh, to get people to move into a neighborhood when there's no grocery store or there's no school or fire station, some of the key elements. So, um, you know, we're, we're struggling at the State House on what the role of government is in that. Uh, but certainly we need to find ways to try and uh, provide tax incentives for, for sp specific neighborhoods uh, that don't have access. Uh, Indianapolis is currently uh, rated the worst city in the entire country for this problem, uh, which is called food deserts, neighborhoods without access to food. So, um, you know, what the, the exact role is, uh, we're still struggling with that at the State House, but I think that it's very clear that there is a problem and we need to work on it. Questions from the audience? You have your two minutes. I won't use all the two minutes. I just, um, if, if I'm reelected, I'll continue to do the things that I've been doing over the last four years. I'll continue to stay open and accessible. Uh, I'll continue to work across the aisle and continue to work on the issues that people give me when I talk with them at their doorstep. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the Republican challenger in this district, Mr. Dale Nye, was invited as well. We now shift our attention from the state level to county level, looking at the Marion County Treasurer's Office. The Marion County Treasurer has the authority to bill, collect, invest, and distribute property. In addition to these responsibilities, the Treasurer serves as Vice President of the Marion County Board of Commissioners and Chair of the Marion County Board of Finance and Secretary of the Information Technology Board. The Democratic incumbent, Claudia Fuentes, began her professional career in economic development. She worked at the Indiana Department of Commerce in the Development of Financial Divisions as a financial analyst. She worked on structuring incentive packages to create jobs for Indiana as the Tax Incentives Manager for the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. You can come on up here as, as we list these off. <laughs> you earned your MBA with a concentration in finance from Butler back in 2007, and a bachelor's in business administration from Indiana University, and you are a lifelong Indiana resident. You have your two minutes. Walk over. 
Good evening, everyone. Um, again, my name is Claudia Fuentes, and I'm the treasurer of Marion County. I want to thank the Westside Chamber of Commerce for the invitation to participate tonight. Um, just wanted to say that it's a little bit of a change of pace. Um, I, I'm the first candidate up here to be at an executive branch, or in the executive branch of government. So a little bit different about policies or or, or changes in, in laws that that would like we would like to have happen. So I've been on the job for over four and a half years now tackling the responsibilities. Um, the four fundamentals that you mentioned earlier are to bill, collect, invest, and distribute property taxes or local taxes. Um, I've had the responsibility of sending property taxes since May 2012, and my team and I, in collaboration with other elected officials and other elected offices, have successfully kept that um, on-time billing. Our collection rates are averaging 98 to 99%. We've incorporated uh, new payment plans and online options for payment. Um, I am responsible for holding funds in trust until distribution to local uh, or to um, units of government. And that is a major responsibility of the office. Over $1.5 billion in tax revenues flow through the office on an annual basis. Um, that includes, um, or it includes investing these funds on a really short-term basis. Um, the environment um, and the activity of, of revenue flow um, is uh, really on a short-term basis in the office, but we take a look at investments that we uh, are the safest and, um, and that uh, do produce a high yield or the highest yields possible in that short term. Um, the units of government find the fourth responsibility to be of utmost importance. Uh, we provide advancements and distributions of property taxes, county option income taxes, local option income taxes, excise tax, financial depository tax, and several others. Uh, the work is administered with accuracy and uh, detail-oriented precision. Um, in my tenure, I've successfully billed, collected, invested, and distributed those taxes. It has not been easy. Uh, there are challenges that we face. It's time to go. Okay. You, you started to hit on this, and I will uh, expand on this. You know full well assessed valuation values are, are critical to the West Side. How, how can your office help deal with, with that issue? Well, unfortunately, with the... Um, with the balance of, um, of powers of the different offices, my office would not be um, responsible for assessed valuation or would have any input in uh, assessed values. However, as we push forward with collections and uh, help individuals to make sure that they are timely in their payments and bring those revenues in, uh, making sure that the West Side, like any other part of the county, is um, uh, receiving all of the revenues that are billed. Questions from the audience? Yes. Is there a number of banks that have been uh, involved in scams, especially in this year time? Uh, because the office has to deal with that issue. Repeat the question, too, please. Um, the question was, there have been a lot of scandals that have happened with big New York banks and several others, and does my office have to deal with those? Um, the answer is no. Uh, there are partner banks that we work with. Um, statutory requirements are that these banks are uh, present in our county to be able to do business with them, and um, most, if not all, of the investments are kept locally. Thank you. Thank you. The Republican challenger, Danielle Coulter, had a scheduling conflict and could not attend this evening. We finish with a view of the Wayne Township and the Wayne Township Board. For your information, we did invite candidates for the Township Boards for Wayne, Decatur, and Pike Township. In many cases, Township Board seats are running unopposed. Democrat incumbent Gary Woodruff is the Township Board Vice Chair and District 1 Representative. Mr. Woodruff, is he here? We may move on rather quickly. I don't see him here. His two minutes are done. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give a round of applause to all of our candidates.
One final time, we want to thank the MSD of Wayne Township and Superintendent Jeff Butts and Chapel Hill 7th and 8th grade center principal Sherry Patterson for making this space available for all of us this evening. I want to remind you as voters of the ongoing Indiana State Police investigation into alleged filing of fraudulent voter application information, the investigation does include Marion County. You can check the accuracy of your voter registration records by visiting indianavoters.com or downloading the app until 11.59 p.m. tonight when the voter registration deadline closes. If you haven't registered, you can still register online tonight or on the app, indianavoters.com. As we conclude, we want to leave you with a final thought by one of the great Hoosiers of all time who said, voting is a civic sacrament. This concludes the 2016 Westside Chamber of Commerce Candidate Forum. Our candidates will be available to chat with you here either inside or outside in the hallway. Please exercise one of the greatest freedoms of our democracy, our civic sacrament, on November 8th. Have a good evening. Thank you. Matt, who said that? Which wine was that? You're supposed to guess. Oh, we were supposed to guess? We didn't guess.